Well, hello. Welcome back to Meraki Unboxed. My name's Simon Thompson, and super happy to have you back again with us. Uh, today, we've got a special episode. We have two gentlemen in the room here who are going to talk to us about some of the amazing work that Cisco does as part of its corporate social responsibility efforts, uh, a group specifically called TACOPS. And, you know, this is typical Cisco. We always love to have these acronyms. This is Tactical Operations. Uh, but I'm not here to uh, to just talk about it because I don't know a huge amount. I have two of the experts on TACOPS in the room with me today. I have Dustin. Say hi, Dustin. Hey, everyone. Hey, and we'll get back to you in just a second. And we have Linus. Hey, hello. Awesome. That was <laughs> You could tell this was not rehearsed, folks. Uh, so <laughs> we're just diving straight in here. So what, what I want to do is just uh, kick off a conversation, and uh, we're going to just explore a little bit about what tactical operations or TAC ops is all about at Cisco, uh, a little bit of the history behind it and so on. But before we get to that, uh, Dustin, tell us a little bit about your background and what you do for Cisco. Sure. So uh, before I joined Cisco, I was working with the United Nations Emergency Telecoms Cluster. Um, setting up emergency communications around the world. My very first deployment was to the Philippines after Typhoon Haiyan in 2013. And we set up Wi-Fi and phones uh, for the first responders and affected populations in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And that really opened my world to, my op opened my eyes to the world of technology in disasters and how we can make such a huge impact using uh, technologies that uh, Meraki provides like Wi-Fi and routing and switching uh, in, in disasters and making sure that the, the people have the connectivity that they need uh, to order more food, to order shelter, to get in contact with their families, uh, to yep. apply for, for visas and asylum. So um, so that was the start of my uh, of my involvement in disaster response in 2013. So that's pretty exciting, but you, you're describing, I mean, we've gone straight into the deep end here. Uh, <laughs> like, so, so before you joined Cisco, yes. you said you joined 2013? Did uh, I get I, that right? I, I started disaster response in 2013, okay. and I joined Cisco uh, about two and a half years ago. As what? What was your role before you moved into the disaster uh, stuff? So before before disaster stuff, I was actually an uh, engineer. Uh, uh, I was actually doing my doctorate in neuroengineering, mm -hmm. neuroscience and engineering, um, working at a university in the Middle East. Uh, and I, I basically, I saw the, the, the typh typhoon come up, uh, and I was like, hey, I wanted to, to, how do I contribute my engineering skills uh, right. to, to help to respond to this disaster in some way? Okay. Um, so I, I, I basically cold called the UN, and I was like, hey, is there a way that I can volunteer with you and uh, go out to the Philippines to use my engineering background, my, my geekdom, to... Right to uh, help these people uh, uh, after the, the really devastating hurricane winds. Um, so that's how I got started uh, in disasters. Awesome. All right, Linus, follow that. <laughs> well, well, tell us a little bit about your background with Cisco. <laughs> so I'm actually a marketing guy at Cisco. My background is in electrical engineering, but I, I just do, do marketing work for the great organization at Cisco that mm -hmm. I'm part of. And uh, I was at a Cisco Live about five, six years ago. That's our big trade show that we have uh, in the U.S. And the last day of the show, last few hours were quite slow. And so I, came, I went by the, 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 the NERV, the Network Emergency Response Vehicle. That's this big 26-foot-long communications truck that we have right. that we deploy. And, uh, and I, I, I met the team and I said, hey, I've got a few hours here. Uh, uh, could I do something? So I, uh, I had my camera with me and I cut a video uh, uh, about how to volunteer for TACOPS, and that was my first volunteering event at TACOPS. Right. Um, so we do this as part of corporate social res social responsibility. There's 10 full-time employees and about 200 volunteers worldwide. Mm -hmm. I'm one of those volunteers. Um, and so uh, I've I had the opportunity to deploy two events, but I've also used my marketing skills to help internally and externally Cisco uh, TACOPS to spread the word of what TACOPS does so that public sector right. knows to call on us if there's a problem, so that it, so that account managers know that we exist and that we can help and put us in touch with the right people because we need to be invited before we are deployed. Mm -hmm. We can't just show up because there's roadblocks, there's customs, yep. there's there's all of that, the details that get really, really complicated. So we, we, uh, we as part of TACOPS, um, are... are uh, or a, te a, 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 a team that, that deploys worldwide, but we uh, but, but we're, we we're based out of uh, out of the U.S. for we, uh, for the core team. Okay, so and I think there's a really important point that you made uh, towards the beginning of that, which is that ways in which you can contribute 
for something like social responsibility work. There's all kinds of different ways. You yes. don't have to be a technical guy. You can be a marketing person, yes. uh, and uh, you can you can make a make a difference in that particular way. Um, all right, so let's let's get into a little bit about the history of tech ops. Uh, Dustin, you uh, you you gave a presentation a little bit earlier on today, uh, where you set some of this stuff out, and I think you said I, I think I correct I'm correct in saying that it's over 50 disaster incidents that uh, TACOPS has been involved in over the course of its history. Maybe just give us a little bit of background about how this thing got kicked off in the first place, how Cisco got involved in this kind of work, and how TACOPS has evolved over the intervening years. Sure. So TACOPS, as we know it today, as a humanitarian response organization, really formed around 2005 with our response to Hurricane Katrina. Um, we sent down many pallets of gear, uh, of, of gear that was really intended for data centers. We sent that down to, to Hurricane Katrina with a bunch of really well-intentioned engineers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we learned a lot from that initial response. Um, it was uh, a very well-meaning people, uh, but there were, there were engineers who hadn't necessarily been trained in how to respond to disasters. They hadn't been trained in the incident command system that we use across the U.S. Right. They hadn't been trained in understanding uh, what, uh, what the conditions might be like, how austere they might be. They might have to live in tents. Uh, so they had the kind of geeky expertise, yes. but they didn't have maybe the real world way to deal with these practical issues that you run into, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, how, how do you integrate with the command system? Who do you report up to? Mm -hmm. Who are the right people to talk to uh, in the logistics cluster or in the, uh, in the logistics section? Um, uh, so, so, yeah, understanding how to integrate into disasters is actually very, very important uh, for our team. So, so today, our team, uh, we, we learned lessons from that, and, and we, we learned that we had to have a, a full-time staff that was trained to respond to, disaster re to disasters right. um, and understood um, how to build those relationships, uh, who, who to talk to during disasters, and, and how to survive without drawing on, on the resources that could be better used for the survivors of the disasters themselves. Mm -hmm. Also, um, as far as equipment goes, so uh, we sent down all these pallets of gear that was, uh, again, really intended for data center environments where you have very clean power, you have air conditioning, right. you have humidity control, you're not exposed to rain and wind and the sun. Um, and that's a very different environment than we typically see in disaster areas where we may be setting up access points under the, the pop-up tent that the emergency operations center is using. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to deal with... Uh, uh, power off of generators, which go up and down right, all the time. Of course. And yeah, it's uh, so it's a very different uh, different environment than we normally see in corporate environments that that uh, that most customers uh, that are use and the products are really targeted for. For sure, so it's like a fresh challenge. Yes, exactly. Every time, I'm sure. Exactly. Every every disaster is different. Yeah. Um, so again, we took lessons from that, and uh, today our team we spend a lot of effort on the research and development. Uh, of the kits and the trucks and all the equipment that we send into disasters. Um, so these these kits and trucks, they're really specifically purpose-built and pre-configured for disasters to make them super, super easy to get in and out of disasters and also to deploy very, very rapidly. Right. And so um, you, what, what we're saying really is that Cisco has put its money where its mouth is here and has chosen to invest in this area as part of its corporate social responsibility efforts. Um, so... So this means that all of the equipment has been kind of bought and paid for by by Cisco, essentially. Is that right? Exactly. We're we're very very lucky to have uh, great great sponsors inside of the company. Mm -hmm. um, everything that that our team does is uh, for free. So um, it's everything. It's entirely pro bono. We can. Uh, deploy to disasters around the world, um, and you don't even have to be a Cisco customer in order to receive our services. We right. really try to make sure that we do this for the right reasons, that we're supporting the the, re the response and recovery efforts uh, for the disaster. Right. Um, so, so we're very lucky to have uh, internal uh, sponsors within this company that fund our operations, including our personnel and equipment and our travel and everything that goes into that. Right. Yes, of course. And and, and I've been we've been using this term corporate social responsibility, which does sound very sort of official <laughs> and important. Uh, it's essentially giving back. Right. I think. Right. It's 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 how we make a contribution back to the communities around us. That's exactly right. Yeah. It, okay. It's the thing that has attracted me actually to to TACOPS is because. Um, I could volunteer in a soup kitchen, 
but I have these very expensive skills mm. that have taken literally decades to acquire, right. right? That I can give back in ways that magnify many times over. Okay. Um, whether it's a deployment or whether it's doing the marketing work for TAC Ops. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense? Makes perfect sense. Sounds like a good plan. Yeah. Although I have to say, I've done the soup kitchen thing a couple of times. Mm -hmm. It's pretty good fun. <laughs> it's like there's so many different ways to do it. And yeah. and uh, and I think there is. Cisco not, gets involved in all kinds we, we of different do. areas. We do, right? we do that as well, right? Yeah. Um, but this is an opportunity for our technical people right, to bring really it bring this together. Yeah. On, on the flip side of it, we our products get better as a result of these deployments. We feed back what we have learned mm -hmm. back to the engineering teams, just like we were doing that today, uh, 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 meeting with the product managers at, at Meraki. Okay. And, 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 and not only telling them what are wish lists, but things that work, things that didn't. Those are very good, valuable conversations that happen. So it's a corporate social responsibility. Even though we do this for free, it doesn't mean that the company doesn't also benefit for that. I mean, doing the right thing doesn't have to be um, – it, it, it can be good for the bottom line as well. Right. Yeah. And it does make sense. I mean, at the end of the day, we're, we're seen as the global experts. We are the yes. we have the gold standard of networking in our yes. back pockets, essentially. So why not put it to good use where we can? Exactly. Um, so so over time, uh, I'm guessing, Dustin, that we've, we've been able to really refine this whole process. Right. I'm sure that when you started, it was pretty experimental. There's like different bits of kit you're trying out to sort of solve some of those challenges outside of a data center environment. How would you say that that's evolved over time and you've modularized things more. Yeah, so so people, um, they often think that the, the the big black truck, the network emergency response vehicle that we drive up, it's kind of a, it's a very shiny vehicle, so people kind of expect that, oh, you may have built this just very recently. Mm. Well, that truck's been around for about 12 years now. Um, so it's gone through a lot of upgrades uh, over time. So what it looks like today on the inside is very different than what it looked like when it was first built. Right. Um, so again, our engineers spend a lot of time doing the research and development uh, into making sure that uh, while we we do keep up to date with the technology that we have, so we have uh, 802.11ac Wave Two mm -hmm. uh, access points uh, in our in our trucks and in our portable kits, um, we we also make sure that they're that they're bulletproof, so that when we get into a disaster, um, the 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 equipment is is ready to deploy. There aren't any bugs in there that could affect the 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 deployment. So that we when we set up networks, we want them to be very, very robust so that we're supporting the first responders, whether it's police, fire, search and rescue, as well as all the nonprofits that are involved in disasters right. in the best way possible. So um, it's it's really been an evolution over a long period of time. So it, it started out being essentially just the trucks, just the vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, and then with our first response in, in international response uh, in Haiti in 2010, then that's when we realized that we also had to, ha to have portable kits to be able to really agilely move uh, overseas as well. So we created right. our first emergency communications kit. Yeah. Uh, and then since then- Because the logistics presumably are Exactly, nightmare. exactly. Yep. Getting, getting a vehicle overseas is very time consuming, very difficult, and very mm -hmm. expensive. Um, while Cisco has a lot of resources, we don't necessarily have uh, a lot of air assets yet. Right. So <laughs> we keep asking for a helicopter, no cargo but it hasn't, hasn't yeah. happened yet. So, um, and, and there's very few planes that, that si of the size that required for the, for, for the nerve. Yeah, only, only yeah. Two it's a world. big truck. Yeah, yeah big truck. exactly. So, so um, since then, since Haiti, we, we started developing these portable kits. So it started out with our emergency communications kit, which is an iOS-based uh, kit with a UPS and a couple access points, Wi-Fi access points, mm -hmm. and a couple of phones in the box. Um, and then we, we evolved to use more and more Meraki in our kits, actually. So uh, our, I think our next kit was our rapid response kit, which is a very small form factor Pelican case that can fit in the overhead bin of an airline compartment. Um, right. And that has a Meraki MX uh, device in it with a, with a Cisco voice over IP phone. So it's kind of our, our first in strike capability so that we can get comms up really quickly. Okay. And then as we continue to evolve our responses, uh, we also developed a phone kit so that we could quickly set up like a 911 call center or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also developed a, a mesh response kit. So uh, this is Meraki based with MR84s in them. Uh, and we, we, with that kit. So that's we, uh, MR84, just for anybody who's not clear, is uh, an outdoor access point. Exactly. Deployment outdoors. The MX as well, obviously, that's a security box, but that. 
<laughs> Sorry, I totally interrupted your flow. No, no, no. Uh, so, so yeah, we have we have all these outdoor access points, these Meraki outdoor access points yep. that we can deploy to cover a large emergency operations center, which may be outdoors or maybe spread across the building, uh, and support with uh, Wi-Fi across the building for all the command staff in there. Awesome. Um, okay, so you, you very casually mentioned these places like Katrina and <laughs> Haiti. Um, th- th- this is these are big deals. They're huge things that have happened. Uh, maybe just give us a sense of the different types of scenarios into which TACOPS has been deployed up till now. That you know the, the natural disaster types and other other scenarios as well. Yeah, absolutely. So. We're really an all hazards team, so we will get to many different types of, of disasters. So whether they are the wildfires that we saw happen uh, last year in Northern California, mm-hmm. uh, for example, with the Mendocino complex fires and the campfire, um, where we supported uh, an emergency operation center or a fire camp with uh, with connectivity. So that's satellite backhaul and, and Wi-Fi. Um, so that's wildfires are, are one type of incident we respond to. Yep. Um, we often respond to hurricanes. So we did two different hurricanes last year, uh, Hurricane Florence and Hurricane Michael, I believe, um, where oftentimes in these in these large high wind scenarios, uh, what you see is that the cell towers will often go down because their antennas are misaligned or the power gets cut or the fiber that backhauls these towers uh, is flooded out. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, so it's really important for us to be able to bring the communications back into these scenarios, uh, whether it's the wildfires, hurricanes, uh, earthquakes we've responded to, um, other kind of even economic disasters uh, where you see a lot of refugees coming out of countries. Right. Um, so so that so we we really um, try to make sure that we make the most impact uh, across the world and across all sorts of different hazards where there's a need for emergency communications. Yeah, and I think I think I think you used a phrase earlier on uh, in the presentation. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact words. Perhaps you do. Hopefully, it's a good test for you. Um, <laughs> but it was something around you know how the priority for TACOPS ultimately is being able to connect people again. Uh, you know that just that's a hugely um, important goal, easy to underestimate, but we're so heavily reliant on comms these days. Yeah, so for example, uh, for the first responders, for the incident commanders, they need to be able to send and receive emails so that they can uh, order supplies or personnel to respond to the, to the wildfire. Um, they need to be able to make phone calls so that they can coordinate uh, around the disaster, and they need to, need to be able to uh, to perform radio interoperability so you can have multiple teams from different jurisdictions communicating with each other inside mm-hmm. of a disaster area. But on the other side of it, beyond the incident command and the first responders, we also want to make sure that we're, we're offering connectivity to the affected populations as well. Right. One of the things that we saw in Greece, for example, uh, was that uh, f- the refugees coming out of Syria, they stepped off the boat and usually the first question they would ask is, where, where am I? Did I land in the right place? Mm-hmm. But then the second question they would ask um, would be, do you have Wi-Fi here? <laughs> and what is the password um, wow. as they took their phones out of their little plastic baggies that kept it safe from the water? Yeah. And, and the reason for that is 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 pretty simple. Like they, w- One is that they, they want to reconnect with their families. They mm-hmm. want to tell their families that they left behind that, hey, we made it safely across into Greece. Uh, this is where you can find us. This is where we are. This is how to get a hold of us. Right. Uh, and then other other issues are that they need to be able to survive now in this foreign country. Mm-hmm. Um, so probably most Syrians don't speak Greek. Um, so how do you communicate yeah. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a completely foreign country? Uh-huh. Um, how do you apply for asylum? How do you apply for legal visa status? Uh, how do you uh, get food, water, shelter, housing? Uh, how do you find a job? Um, so, so these things are really, really important to not just the, the incident commanders and the first responders, but also to the, to the p- people who are directly affected by these disasters. Mm. It's, a, it's an amazing story, and it just underscores and something which I've always personally loved about the industry I chose to dedicate my career to, and that is uh, that, that ultimately we're about connecting people, whatever it happens to be for, whether it's for business or for potentially a, you know, a life and death situation as you've encountered a number of times. It's amazing, amazing stuff. Um, I'm very aware that uh, that Dustin has uh, his own emergency going on right now, which is a parking situation here in San Francisco. It's a real thing that we have to deal with here in the city. Don't bring your car to San Francisco, folks. Um, so, Dustin, if you need to get going, that's totally cool, and I can continue the conversation with uh, with Linus. 
thank you so much for coming in and joining us. It's awesome. All right. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, all right. So, Linus, tell us about the deployments that you've had involvement in up to this point. So one of the things that I'd first like to touch on before we do that is um, one of our taglines is secure disaster communications. Um, and security is critical for us. Um, so we've seen things, everything from – because hastily deployed networks are now actually attack vectors. Mm -hmm. uh, Good people, point. Uh, so people are looking for these for disasters and looking for these networks that are uh, that are that, that are quickly deployed. So we, we've seen everything from from potential theft of uh, of uh, firefighters' credit cards. Mm -hmm. So you could imagine who would be interested in who's coming over on those boats from uh, from from uh, to Greece. You know, we've got state actors involved. So we yeah. we need to protect both the the people who are most vulnerable as well as those people that are helping the people who are vulnerable. Wow. So to make that make their mission successful and to keep them safe, truly safe because this is it's a it's it's a nasty world out there. Mm. So we're going past connectivity and we're talking about, you know, security as well. Yes. Uh, and so I'm sure we have a plethora of different tools to help us with that. Just give us an example of some of the some of the technology that we deploy to to help us with that area. Sure. I mean, what we what a fantastic for us tool the MX device is mm -hmm. because it's it's I mean if you think about d disasters and our, uh, um, we sometimes have to manage the network remotely mm -hmm. we can't get in or it might be something like Ola where we really shouldn't go in or it could be something like uh, or or we need to, so remote management low power um, uh, and 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 easy to set up security so. Um, We've uh, so let's let's look at the uh, uh, Ebola crisis. We're able to um, some of the NGOs that were there had unmanaged uh, laptops. Okay. So you had all sorts of viruses on on those laptops as well. The, you know, at the end of the day, they may have had a really hard day. They want to watch a little bit of YouTube before they go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Problem is, that we were on a very expensive uplink. Right. So but probably not a huge amount of bandwidth. I'm guessing. Not, not a huge amount of bandwidth either. But so 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 what we're able to do is to to limit the the the, the what they're able to do on that network so that we can extend the the length of the deployment. Right. Because there was yeah. fixed cost to 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 the satellite uplink. Get more value out. More of it more real way. value, right? Yeah. Um, so and you can prioritize different applications. You can prioritize or even stop uh, applications, and right. it's very easy to do. You know, let's just stop social media, stop, 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 stop YouTube, stop Netflix, right? Yep. A couple of clicks on on the MX and you're done. Right. Right. As well as uh, as well as uh, uh, as well as the secure security features, that we, other security features that we have. You know, I mean, if there, if there's uh, if a laptop is compromised, we can uh, you can isolate it or we can uh, stop traffic. We do source source of other things. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Um, Dustin is still hitting, sitting here, folks. I think I, I think I may have spoken too soon. His, his parking situation may have been resolved. What's the story, Dustin? Give us the latest scoop. I, I'm hoping my teammates took care of it, sir. Uh, I have faith. I have faith in them, sir. Uh, Let me explain what's going on here, folks, because because you're you're going to be completely blind, of course. Um, the the uh, these these wonderful folks from the TAC Ops team have come and visited us at uh, headquarters today. That's the whole premise for uh, for this conversation, uh, as well as numerous other uh, efforts that they've made here. They brought their big shiny Nerf truck. It's incredibly clean. They look after it, obviously, uh, and they've been running tours here. And we've done a little presentation for for the Meraki folks here. It's obviously hugely interesting to us to be able to see how our own technology is being used in these more complex scenarios. So anyway, this is why, because uh, they brought the truck, they had to park the truck. That's a great big thing that sits on the, on the street and we're in a very busy part and, of San Francisco. And then we had to move the truck and so now we're in a sort of precarious location. <laughs> no, it's, it's just turning into a, into a soap opera story very, very rapidly. That's right. That's right. So we, 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 like, we like this stuff. It's spontaneous. Stuff. That's <laughs> what we're doing. This is li like live radio so, as good so as. I realize I didn't answer your question though about uh, deployments. So yeah. things like, uh, things like uh, Sonoma wildfires, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes the deployments are multiple weeks. It's a maximum of two weeks uh, length. But for example, the Sonoma wildfire, we dropped off a satellite dish for for Cal Fire, and then uh, w uh, there was uh, um, there was a lot of that evacuees from nursing homes, from from well, people from from their own homes, uh, from hospitals. They were all uh, um, at the fairgrounds, and we, and we used uh, some Meraki devices to set up some connectivity for them, uh, because uh, one of the service provider networks was down. So we we leveraged off the other service provider's network and provided Wi-Fi for them. 
So you've got to be pretty adaptable. You've got to be able to, to do things quickly. Every single time yeah. you're, 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 you're using duct tape, every single time you're climbing a tree or a ladder mm-hmm. or whatever else, every single time is different. You do what you have to do. You do what you have to do. It makes it interesting. And I think, I mean, Dustin, you touched on earlier on about this rapid response kit and the, the inclusion of Meraki in there. Maybe, um, I mean, you've both talked about this to some extent. Maybe just tell us about what you really like about the Meraki gear from a from a from from that perspective, right? In that kind of scenario, because we always think of it, you know, we're picturing it in a in a retail store or yeah. in a in a hospitality situation. Yeah. This is entirely different. Yeah. So so thanks for that softball. Uh, <laughs> um, so so uh, I guess I'll say that that I I personally love Meraki gear for the deployments that we do because it's. And this is not because I'm a Cisco employee or anything, or I'm not part of marketing. I'm like Linus, but <laughs> I, I like it because I like it because it really solves the problem that we're trying to to solve for yeah. in disasters. Um, as as Linus touched on, that the MXs they have this incredibly awesome security capability in such a small form factor. Mm-hmm. So they're just like one inch thick and, and a couple a couple inches on each side. And, and you can get uh, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention. You can get advanced malware protection. Right. You can get retrospective malware detection. Uh, so, so keeping the people safe, uh, our, the, the firefighters, the refugees, keep, keeping them safe on our networks is really important to us. Mm-hmm. And the MXs really make that super, super simple for us. Every kit that we have and every kit that we deploy is pre-configured out of the box to have security enabled on these networks. So we don't even have to think about it. It's, right. it's there by default. Right. So, and you mentioned also earlier on, I remember, uh, which I'm sure is super useful, is this ability to have different forms of connectivity into the MX from the WAN side. Right? Exactly, exactly. So, so oftentimes in disasters, we'll use whatever internet we can get our hands mm-hmm. on. So. Um, if we have to bring satellite dishes out, then we'll do that. Uh, if we can get access to LTE in a particular area, we'll do that. If we can help a carrier come back from the dead, so to speak, uh, and, and bring their, their fiber back up, then we'll do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so oftentimes this means that we have multiple kind of semi-reliable connections that we have to, yeah. we have to, to deal with. Um, so on the MXs that we deploy, they each have two WAN ports. So we're able to load balance across uh, each WAM port and automatically fail over if we have to. Okay. Um, and we also have uh, cellular modems on, on those MXs as well. So um, so basically, we have three different WAN options uh, on, on each of our MXs. And that's really important to us uh, in disasters because, again, we're using whatever we can we can duct tape together yeah. to, to yeah. get connectivity into this disaster area. Right. And, and okay, of course, this is not meant to be a sales pitch for Meraki. We try and avoid being too overt about that. Uh, we, we're trying to keep it real here. But I, I will say this. I, I, I'm fairly confident from the nature of the work that you guys do that you would not be using equipment that you had any kind of concerns over or you weren't confident in. So you've really, you've, you're choosing the right stuff for the specific job in hand. Yeah, I mean, I can be real. Our, our team, we use third-party equipment where it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there are solutions that that work better from third parties than, than uh, I hate to say it, than, than what Cisco is able to provide. Or, or Cisco so, doesn't have the equivalent, equivalent. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so. And, and, and I mean, to be honest, we we do we do also use use the equipment in very interesting corner cases that, that many right, of the Cisco sure. products were not specifically designed right, for. Right, right, as you said at the beginning, yes, the data center thing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but the MXs work incredibly well for what we're trying to do. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, they're low power, so we can run off solar if we have to. Uh, they're remote managed uh, so that, um, for example, in the Philippines, we had a challenge there where we dropped off our emergency communications kit, which is iOS-based, um, and uh, there was a challenge with the, there was a problem with the, with the uplink in the backhaul, uh, but we left the kit with a the soldier there. Um, and then we had to call the soldier over a sat phone, a satellite phone, and try to explain to him how to console into an iOS router. He hadn't really had any experience with that. Right, As you right. can imagine, that's, that's, a, that's a challenge, right? That's it. And the iOS router, just, just for anybody who's not clear about it, we're not talking about Apple's iOS here. This is Cisco's uh, internet operating system. Did I get that right? I think so. <laughs> I think that's what it stands for. And uh, um, it's been around forever, and it is like really the industry standard, so you probably have heard of it. But I just wanted to make sure. Yes, thank yes. you. Yep. Um, so... In contrast to these iOS writers, uh, or, or, or to the normal setup of, of iOS writers, at least back in the day, um, with Meraki, we have this really nice cloud-managed dashboard where if uh, if we need to change a configuration, we can do that remotely, as long as the Meraki has, a, has, a, has an uplink to the internet somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
uh, if we need to add additional phones to to the network, we can configure the MXs to do that. If we need to add another SSID, another wireless uh, network, uh, to uh, to be broadcast so that we can prioritize for uh, for the commanders, uh, we can yeah. do that. Uh, if we need to block certain types of traffic, if someone's trying to pull down Netflix 4K over a satellite dish, we can do that. Uh, right. And that's and this can all be done remotely, which means we don't have to staff every site that we're deployed to, which is huge for us. So you have some kind of a, a command center, if you like, when, when you're deployed remotely? Is that like remote? We actually, yeah, we actually have what we call crisis support rooms in mm -hmm. both our, both, basically both our headquarters in San Jose and uh, Research Triangle Park. Um, and uh, we're, able to, we're able to do remote troubleshooting um, really from anywhere in the world. Um, so uh, we, have, uh, we have folks who are always on call uh, and able to respond to requests and monitor networks. Our engineers do an amazing job uh, keeping the networks uh, alive, uh, given all the challenges and disasters. Yeah, um, sure. So um, Meraki really, really enables that for us in a way that it has not had not been able had not been possible for us. So so scale is something that Meraki has has really helped us with. In Puerto Rico, uh, together with our NGO partner called NetHope. Um, we were able to deploy more than 70 sites across the island. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you can imagine trying to support all of that um, with kind of traditional tools uh, where you had to uh, console into every, every router to change any con configurations, yeah. that would have been nearly impossible, a nearly impossible task. Mm. Um, but with Meraki, we're able to monitor the quality of the internet uplink. So if, if for example, the satellite antenna gets misaligned for some reason, we can know that. Uh, we can infer that from from the uplink data right, of course. from the from the MXs. Yeah. Um, if we if we see that we're running out of uh, IP leases because there are too many people on the network, we can expand the subnet remotely. Right. Um, so it's it's really really made a huge difference in our ability to get to more and more sites, especially since we seem to be responding to more and more disasters every year. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and actually, you you, you touched on. Uh, the partners that you work with, the non-Cisco partners, because of course we're not the only ones who show up in these situations, right? Correct. So how, how does that work? How do, how do we do the um, the kind of interop with the other the other um, NGOs you mentioned and, uh, and and other groups? That's a great question. So so people ask us all the time, what do you do when you're not deployed into disaster yeah. as, as as a full time staff as a member? Uh, and and the, I, a large part of the answer is we spend a lot of time building relationships both with the nonprofits that you were talking about, like NetHope, mm -hmm. uh, American Red Cross, uh, ICRC, um, International Medical Corps. Um, these are all nonprofits that we often support time and again in, in disasters. Uh -huh. um, so, so they understand what it is that we do in disasters, what we can offer, how to get a hold of us, mm -hmm. um, and how quickly we can respond. Uh, and that's that's really important to establish these relationships uh, ahead of the disasters, because you know during the disasters everyone's hair is on fire. Everyone's trying to run around, uh, and and get get the get the business they need to do get done. And they don't have time to worry about hey, are these guys trying to sell us something or not? Um, are are they are they uh, really a for free service? People really don't believe that yeah. that we <laughs> that we provide this for free, and, and we have to keep reassuring them that yes, <laughs> you don't have to have a contract, you don't have to be a customer. It's it's really being done for the right reasons. Right. Um, so so we spend a lot of time building these relationships. Uh, both one-on-one -on -one as well as at disaster conferences. Uh, we try to provide a lot, lot of thought leadership so that people can really learn from what we've tried uh, and, and uh, what we've, what we've uh, attempted to do and what, what has worked really well for us in disasters, right. what hasn't worked well for us in disasters. Um, so again, we go to a lot of conferences trying to, trying to provide the, the benefit of our experience experiences mm -hmm. over these last 14 years uh, in disasters. So. Um, so yeah, we spend a lot of time building relationships with nonprofits, but also with you know government partners, uh, international partners like the United Nations. Mm -hmm. uh, we work closely with uh, the U.S. Uh, federal, state, and local governments uh, across the board, uh, as well as kind of hazard-specific agencies like Cal Fire. Wow, it's a long list. I've got good memory. You still remember? <laughs> He's <laughs> pretty amazing. Um, He's good, isn't yes. he? <laughs> He's fantastic. Yes. We um, also do a lot of internal marketing within Cisco because yes. public sector is really important. Right. And so the, the account managers know who the people in the public sector are. So if there's something that happens locally that, that, that needs our help, we know who who then we need to reach out to right. because we need so to be invited. Already. We can't just show up. We can't go through because 
because uh, because you, you need to get to customs, you need to get the roadblocks, all that mm -hmm. sort of things, right? Mm -hmm. Um, right. And I'd like to maybe rewind this, the, the clock a little bit here because you may have even been, been involved in our very, very first Meraki deployment. Wow. Shortly after uh, 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 Meraki became far, part of the Cisco family, I knew I, 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 was, I was involved a little bit with that. I knew Meraki. Mm -hmm. I also knew TACOPS. And I, I, was, I was looking, this is great technology for TACOPS. So I, I, you may have given me the first uh, MX device I brought over. And it was like, hey, guys, check this out. You know? I, was, I was very generous in those days. <laughs> yes, you were. <laughs> That's a right? long time ago. And, and, so, and so that, we put that in the Pelican case. And we'd, uh, one of our team members took it to a, was t on, a, on a plane to, uh, in, to Dubai for a conference. Mm -hmm. On that plane flight, the, the earthquake in Nepal happened. Um, and so in its overhead bin friendly little pelican case with a right. like so it just looks like luggage right mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we have we had he had the ability to then call everybody at the conference was going now, now to Nepal because it's a humanitarian cri crisis wow. right so the conference is c canceled so the team member said reached out to his friend and said take this box you don't know what this is take this I'll show you how to set it up or we will color code the cables uh, bring it to Nepal use it Right, and that was, I think, the the first Meraki deployment. It was literally Amazing. at the airport, sort of this handoff. Go, right, right. off to Kathmandu. Totally unplanned. <laughs> totally and just unplanned. Figuring it all out on the and fly. And it worked. It because worked well, and we were number. and we managed it remotely. Right. And it was like, huh, this is this is awesome. Like it wasn't operationalized yet. We were right. we were just going to show this at a conference, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, That's and an so, amazing story. Right. So thank you for that. Hey, you're very welcome. And actually, I I, I don't even remember if you've told me that story before. It's an amazing, uh, amazing story. We're capturing it all here, recording it for posterity <laughs> at this point in time. Um, okay. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how we share information about what TACOPS is doing. If, if, if folks who are listening want to learn a little bit more, they're interested in digging a little bit deeper, where can they go to, to learn more? So we have a, a number of different uh, external facing sites. So we have our uh, our external webpage, which is cs.co slash tacops is the short, short way to get to it. Mm -hmm. And on that page, we have a, a list of, of many of our responses that we've done. We have some information about the, the kits that we that we use in our disasters. We don't sell them. Uh, we're just kind of sharing information with, with the community. Um, uh, and we also have uh, a bunch of uh, social media sites. So we do have a Facebook page. Uh, so if you search for Cisco TAC Ops, you'll find us there. We're and just to be clear, TAC Ops, for, for those who haven't seen that word written down, we love our acronyms at Cisco. Yes. T-A-C-O-P-S. Correct. Exactly. Thank you very much. All right. Sorry. Facebook. Keep going. Yes. <laughs> Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter. We're, we're over all of those properties. So right. Um, we don't typically uh, post anything during disasters, uh, during deployments for the for the security of our personnel. Um, yep. But uh, we do often uh, uh, post, uh, with permission, uh, uh, photos uh, after the disaster deployment. And we also have a lot of uh, planned events. So we do a lot of STEM events. Uh, so science, technology, education, and math. We have students from, from high schools, middle schools, elementary schools, college interns. Uh, they... they uh, we, we provide um, kind of an insight in, uh, to them to what you could be doing as an engineer uh, beyond just you know sitting at, at your desk. Right. Um, there's there's so much more to that you can do and and, and how you can uh, really make an impact on the world using the skills that you can develop uh, in these sorts of STEM careers. Mm -hmm. um, so so we do a lot of planned events like that, um, so, and we have photos and, and pictures and, and stories from from those events. As well, yeah. Well, Actually, it was one of the things. Sorry, let's real quick. Um, I think before I forget, <laughs> that's all I'm trying to do. Um, it was really nice seeing we, we in the presentation that we gave earlier on. We had quite a few, I think, engineers in the room from the from the Meraki engineering team, and you know, I, I could almost feel their excitement building a little bit as they as they envisaged how some of their sort of hard work they spend all day staring at code, and they're and they're seeing the results. Then they're and they're seeing this story these stories unfold of how this technology can be put into use and how they could potentially be a part of it a contributor to it as well yeah absolutely the, yeah. the impact is is really so real um and and you can see it you can see it in, in the stats that we that we have on our on our dashboard yeah um we have thousands of clients every day we we push uh terabytes of information every month um i think our the last number i saw was like we're pushing more than a gig and a half uh uh, per second uh, uh, over over our networks. So, uh, the ones that are hope. live? That are live today. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Busy. So so it's, it really makes a huge difference in 
uh, both the lives of the refugees and the other affected populations, mm -hmm. and, as well as in the, in the incident response and, and uh, being able to, again, you know, order, order supplies, order shelter, order personnel to respond to wildfires or hurricanes or, or search and rescue. That's, that's, that's so critical. Um, and it's, it's really hard to convey um, how, how much impact uh, that is um, until you actually go out into a disaster and, and you see, like, you know, you, you flip on the Wi-Fi and everyone's immediate, immediately trying to, to text and send emails and, yeah. and to pull down situational information about the disaster. Yep. Um, and, and that's really why, you know, I switched. Uh, getting into disaster response was, was a very kind of left turn for me, mm -hmm. um, going from, you know, a neuroscience engineering uh, into the into network engineering is, is very 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 different sure um, but you know when I when I deployed into the Philippines and I saw that sort of impact that that really changed my perspective on how I could make a dent on the world so so absolutely these these networks that, that we're setting up with especially with the Meraki uh, gear the Meraki equipment they're they're uh, really making a huge difference in people's lives it's awesome Dennis I interrupted you as well one of the things that I wanted to touch upon was that we've mentioned that we you, you can't buy the truck from us and you can't buy the kits from us. We don't make it off the shelf yet. We're not we selling it. There's no <laughs> skew. There's no skew. There's no skew. You, <laughs> there is no skew. What we can do, uh, and we do this for free as well, is consulting, mm -hmm. free consulting, so that we can help you build an appropriate version of the truck, share our best practices, right. but build an appropriate kit. And not just for public sector, but also for business continuity purposes. So if you're a company and you're worried about, well, what's going to happen after an earthquake? How do I continue my business? Mm -hmm. We can share, We can help you understand what you should do. Okay. And, and how does how do people even engage yeah. with that if that's an just go to our, go to our website the contact information is there reach yeah. out and and probably Dustin will get the call <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so we, we do have a very strong consulting program um, and, and like Dennis was saying uh, oftentimes uh, government agencies or nonprofits they'll see us deploy these kits and vehicles into disaster areas and they immediately think, how do we get that sort of same capability for our organization? Right, um, makes sense. So, so we're, we're very happy to provide, uh, again, the benefit of our 15 or 14, 15 years of experience in disasters and tell you what works and what doesn't. And, and, and you know, with all apologies to Cisco and Meraki's uh, sales teams, we'll, we'll, we'll be very honest about what works uh, well and what, what doesn't. And, and we'll, we'll tell you, you know, uh, yeah, the the Meraki stuff is is really really great for disasters, but there's some other things that that maybe some some other parties might be better better suited for. Totally it. fair. So. Totally or or, fair. Cisco, or this, I mean, the traditional Cisco gear is, is ha, ha, we we use a lot of that as well uh, on on deployments, right? And so it's it's this interesting mix, right? But it's that best use case thing every yes. time. Well, and, and and there's a lot of corner cases as well. So how do we do this or how do we do that? Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are. Uh, gentlemen, this has been a really interesting talk. I've enjoyed this. Thank you very much indeed for taking some time out to join us on this uh, podcast today. Uh, so, folks, just to remind you, the website you need to go to, cs.co forward slash T-A-C-O-P-S, TACOPS. That's where you can jump off and start learning more about what this fabulous organization is doing uh, by way of giving back. Uh, to the communities around us, not just here in North America, but right around the world as well. Thanks a lot, gentlemen. Uh, you have been listening to Meraki Unboxed, and uh, we've had a great fun episode today, and we have plenty more great content for you as well. Uh, hopefully you're a subscriber at this point. If you're not, why not? Please go along to your favorite podcast tool and uh, subscribe today. Then you'll get them in your uh, app as soon as they are released, and we try and do that uh, once every two weeks or so. So my name's Simon Thompson. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Meraki Simon. And I definitely encourage you to reach out if you've got any questions, uh, anything you'd like us to cover on the podcast, anything relating to the uh, stuff we've been talking about today, whatever it is, give us some feedback. Uh, that really helps us to make sure we keep this as relevant as we can. Thanks for taking time out to listen to us. And we hope you have a really enjoyable rest of your day. We'll speak to you again in a couple of weeks. Bye for now. <laughs>